Hi there, everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to our latest uh, Bright Talk Summit, Leveraging AI in D Enterprise, um, Why Semantic Knowledge is So Important for Trustworthy Enterprise AI. We're going to try and talk around um, the, the tooling, uh, the, the right tools to use um, when uh, using AI and why semantic knowledge uh, management tools and knowledge graphs in general um, have such a high importance uh, when selecting those. Joining us uh, will be Imran Chowdhury along with myself. Uh, Imran is our resident AI uh, expert. He's one of our chief architects here. He's doing a lot of work in the life uh, science and healthcare arena um, and has actually uh, put the, together the architecture that, uh, that we'll be discussing today. Wanted to start off with some of the questions that we've already been getting from our customers. Um, so these questions, um, customers are, uh, are already asking uh, themselves and their vendors um, when it comes to AI and generative AI specifically. You know, they're, they're looking at how can they grow their business? Um, you know, is it an opportunity or is it a threat uh, to our business? Um, is it secure to use? Um, and, and that's kind of dovetailing into how can we merge our business data with generative AI tools and in a secure fashion. Um, you know, this is backed up by what we're seeing elsewhere in the market. You know, we just look at a couple of stats here from Gartner where, you know, 55% of organizations are already piloting or in production mode, which is, you know, which is pretty, pretty good considering it came out at the start of the year. Um, for, for, for generative AI um, and 55% of organizations that are deployed AI are now taking an AI first strategy when it comes to looking at new use cases uh, in their business. Um, this is kind of summed up here. Um, this is a great quote um, from uh, a distinguished VP analyst at Gartner that says that organizations are not just talking about generative AI, they're actually investing time, money, and resources to move it forward and critically drive business outcomes. Uh, generative AI is now on the CEO's and board's agenda as they seek to take advantage of the transformational uh, potential of this new technology. Um, you know, and it's very much in conversations that I'm having as part of our customer success team here um, with a number of our customers already looking at these solutions and how they can bring them into their business and leverage uh, the advantages that, that they can do. But we're starting to see some pushback, some challenges um, in that. And um, we think we've put together um, a really good approach to, to, to some of those key challenges. Um, this is the, the era of AI. If we, we want to talk about, we're moving from the general information age um, we're going into this era of AI, and I think this is just pro progress's mission statement as is. Um, but I think it really speaks to um, what AI is going to do for businesses. You know, progress's mission is to be the trusted provider of the best products to develop, deploy, and manage high impact applications. And that is very much what these AI tools can deliver if. Um, architected correctly um, and deployed correctly within your business. You can trust an AI solution. You just have to have the right information uh, surrounding the data that you use with it. Um, so with that, let me hand over to uh, Imran Chowdhury. Uh, Imran? Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. As Phil said, there's, there's a lot going on in the AI space, and a lot of people are moving very quickly. Uh, the AI space itself is moving very quickly. What we're going to be talking here about here is really how to make the AI systems trustworthy, repeatable, uh, safe for your enterprise, uh, providing them with context that's very much necessary for them to answer questions or do tasks that, that you're asking them to do. So we'll, we'll quickly go over generative AI applications, some of the major concerns that people have, uh, discuss what short-term memory and tokens looks like, uh, 
talk about a couple of architectures of general purpose generative question and answer, and then uh, RAG, which is retrieval augmented generation. Uh, and then when you're doing retrieval augmented generation, the key question is, well, okay, um, what is uh, the place where I will retrieve the data from? And um, that really is a long-term memory, which, which uh, it really acts like a long-term memory. And then uh, we'll go over uh, Mark Logic and Semaphore and how we can provide a lot of the key characteristics needed for a, a long-term memory for an AI system. All right, uh, obligatory disclaimer. Um, we'll be talking about a lot of genera generative AI systems. Um, those are not owned or operated by Progress, and so just want you to be aware of that. So uh, about at the beginning of the year, I came across this quote, uh, and it made a lot of sense to me. The winners of AI systems uh, will be uh, those who know how to use AI systems, but also those who have proprietary data. Uh, AI is heading towards becoming ubiquitous for every corporation as well as for every person personally. And so uh, the edge is going to be get, uh, obtained uh, from a business perspective with the private data that the business operates and uses. There's a lot of different applications. Uh, there, because these generative AI tools not only understand language, but also image and video and 3D uh, and brain scans, um, there's a lot of different ways of sort of understanding semantic objects uh, in, the, in the various uh, modality spaces. And, and each of those spaces has a lot of different kinds of applications that people can put together. Also, uh, not only is it uh, a lot of different applications, but a lot of different sectors uh, uh, have been um, using generative AI already and will continue to benefit from the use of generative AI. Uh, manufacturing has been doing a lot of work in R&D and optimization and development of production systems, uh, especially with robots. Uh, in the energy space, um, data analytics and demand forecasting and energy optimization are things people think about. In the healthcare space, drug discovery, medical imaging, disease diagnosis, um, patient treatment next steps, medical research, all these kinds of things come into play. In banking, fraud, risk detection, predictive analytics, credit evaluations, financial analysis are all, all really good use cases for generative AI. So generative AI systems have uh, basically a working memory, uh, which we can call it a short-term memory. And uh, that short-term memory currently is uh, reasonably small. Uh, ChatGPT 3.5 started off with 4,000 tokens, and GPT-4 now has up to 32,000 tokens. Uh, there's an open source uh, large language model that has the ability to handle 64,000 tokens. And Anthropic, which is now working closely with AWS, has the ability to handle 100,000 tokens. So a, lot, a question that quite often comes up is what the heck are these tokens? Uh, and how do they affect what the generative AI does in terms of its work or its answers? So here's an example of that. Uh, basically, tokens are, are chunks of words. Uh, sometimes they're whole words um, in, in terms of how the model represents the incoming data. Uh, and each of these colors here represents a token, right? So continuous, for example, has two tokens, glucose has three tokens, and monitoring has one token. So just to follow a particular token through this set of words, uh, we're just going to look at the, right? And the shows up three times in the in these words. And then if we were to click on the token ID uh, and see what was the what the model was looking at under the hood, um, we can see that 262 shows up three times, and that is representing the word the in this particular model. Now the numbers will change from model to model and from vectorization to vectorization. So just be aware of that. Uh, a generative AI system basically takes this string of numbers or, or the series of numbers and uh, then works on predicting what it should do from a next number perspective. 
So it creates these next set of numbers, which is the answer or the task that it's working on, and those get converted back into words and, and get presented to users. And that, that's how, under the hood, the generative AI systems work. So uh, the first kind of architecture is, is sort of the out-of-the-box service from the generative AI systems. And really, it's basically a question and answer system where you present questions to the generative AI, and the generative AI responds. Some of the benefits are that it's readily available. Um, uh, the generative AI has been trained on large sets of data, so it can do a decent job for, for general knowledge questions. Um, some of the challenges that exist are limited context length, right? The, the short-term memory window that we talked about, the lack of the ability to control the output, um, the training data sets might cause biases or inaccuracies, and um, hallucinations, which is sort of made up answers based on the lack of context that, gener that the generative AI system has. Um, so it, it doesn't know enough, so it, it just predicts, right? Uh, some examples of hallucinations include uh, this um, uh, uh, sort of bio summary. Everything in red is, is, is false information. Another example is uh, in the coding space, this Gen AI picked up a library that doesn't exist. Um, uh, then um, uh, math tends to be a problem with these things. Uh, it's thinking that the difference between the two dates is less than an hour, but then in parentheses it says it's only eight hours and 54 minutes. So the less than concept is, is sort of missing in this one. Uh, and then, um, uh, just a fact uh, extraction from uh, Monkey Island Games. Uh, it answered twice, even when it was told the first time that the answer was wrong, it answered incorrectly the second time, right? So these are all things that happen. When I first started using these, these systems, uh, the second question I asked was completely wrong, right? So I was, at that point, I was hitting a 50% error rate, right, which was pretty bad. Uh, so hallucinations exist. They're, they're they're out there. They confidently confidently state incorrect data 15 to 20 percent of the time. That's a, a reasonable range to expect right now. Um, I, I had one person um, comment on the fact that well, hallucinations are really a lack of context. So if you can give these systems a lot better context, uh, then they will do a better job of answering the questions, and that's perfectly valid. Uh, on the data side, if the data has biases, the generative system is going to incorporate those biases into its learnings and trainings, and it's going to uh, spit those back at users when they ask questions or give it tasks. Sometimes it has a hard time understanding, um, uh, reasoning, and, and following um, sort of complicated step-based stuff. That uh, one, one way to sort of get around that is to tell people or tell these Gen AI systems to think about things and, and break it up into steps and maybe get approval of the steps before it starts executing on them, right? So, so there's ways to sort of get it to, to think in, in smaller chunks and it tends to do better when it does that. Um, training takes a long time and a lot of effort. Uh, so these systems typically are about a year and a half to two years out of date in terms of their knowledge base. Uh, also, these things are black boxes. It's really hard to explain what's why you got the answer that you got if in in sort of a general Q and A scenario. Uh, and then robustness, um, even with uh, training against uh, uh, answering harmful or or dangerous questions, uh, there are very easy ways to quote unquote jailbreak these things and 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 start producing answers that the model was not intended to produce. So um, uh, how do we improve the Gen AI answers? Well, uh, one, one way to go about improving it is to give it your own personal or your own private enterprise data or your own personal data um, and, and say, hey, learn on this and, and use these as examples for, for uh, on top of what you were trained on, right? So that's called fine tuning. Uh, and then the another um, uh, solution that has gained a lot of acceptance and, uh, and has had a lot of success is retrieval augmented generation or RAG. And that's really 
uh, understanding the question or the task that the user's, user is asking, retrieving data from uh, specific systems to give that user, to give the Gen AI uh, enough context so that it can accurately answer or perform the tasks that it's being asked to do. So with uh, fine tuning, um, it does enhance LLM output for specific tasks, um, but it, uh, and it doesn't require a lot of data, but, but it tends to be um, very much hit or miss and trial or error. And if you tune it on one specific thing, other things might stop working or, or regress or degrade further. Uh, another major concern about fine tuning is data or IP leakage. If you tune it with private data that say only 10% of your organization is supposed to be able to access and, and take advantage of, uh, potentially the remaining 90% of the organization might be able to reverse engineer what that, what that private data was, uh, what, what the Gen AI was trained on, um, and, and basically ask questions to extract and recreate that private data, right? So, so, so there's a major security and leakage concern here. Um, also, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of uh, compute power to do this kind of uh, work. So uh, RAG, on the other hand, um, is conceptually very simple. Uh, what you're doing is the user asks a query. The query goes and performs a semantic uh, multi-model search or a semantic vector database search. Um, you get back relevant uh, and potentially relevant answers which can then be further refined and screened before they're sent to the Gen AI system. Uh, and, and now the Gen AI system in its short-term memory and its working token memory has a lot of referential data that it can use to answer questions much more accurately and uh, also not only answer them accurately, but they can also provide you with um, the references back to the original data set so that users can check the data, uh, validate the answers. Uh, some of that validation could also happen automatically as part of the checking process before you send the data back to the user. So, so those sorts of things um, are, are, are coming into play and have had a lot of success in Gen AI implementations. Another possibility, if you're really worried about feeding any kind of data to your Gen AI system, is to run your own and, and within your own enterprise, within your own private cloud. Um, again, this is a, an expensive proposition, but, but larger organizations are, are headed down this path as well. So the next thing we want to talk about is, is a little bit about knowledge graphs and uh, why they're so important in, in the RAG architecture. Uh, knowledge graphs are, are typically composed of two different things, uh, concepts uh, and relationships between those concepts. And um, uh, these were invented by Tim Berners-Lee, the person who invented the, the, the web as well. He, he started a standard whereby computers could uh, be able to under read and understand pages or content on pages. Uh, that is uh, semantically relevant. Um, and uh, so, so a lot of companies have, have been working on being able to consume those knowledge graphs, uh, author those, govern those, um, and then um, be able to capture basically subject matter knowledge expertise from within the organization to, to uh, into these knowledge graphs. And then once you have them in those knowledge graphs, you can start reusing them at, at compute scale. Right. You can reuse them across multiple servers simultaneously and so on, right? Uh, and, you know, we had talked a little bit about concepts and entities. Uh, in, in sort of the healthcare space, an entity might be a, a member, uh, uh, a provider, a disease, a treatment, um, a hospital, a clinic, a plan. And then relationships are those are things that relate those concepts of entities together to each other. So. A member could have diabetes. Diabetes is definitely a disease. It has synonyms, DM1, DM2, uh, and so on, right? Um, uh, members can be treated with insulin injections or treated by Dr. Smith and so on, right? So, 
So those relationships are really important to capture as well uh, from a semantics perspective when you start thinking about your business and how uh, it operates and what is important to people that are trying to analyze the business and, and, and operate it. Uh, once you have that semantic graph built out, uh, and you can use it for a lot of things. You can extract facts from unstructured data. You can classify unstructured data and say, hey, this article is about uh, the diabetic disease and treatments based on a new insulin similar drug, but not quite insulin. Right. So, so that, those are things that you could classify uh, content on. Um, and then also you can use the models to help you make the data, even if it's coming from different sources, look the same, operate at the same level of quality, uh, so that, the, that what you end up feeding to the Gen AI systems becomes very consistent and very uh, ready for uh, providing the right context that these Gen AI systems really need. So uh, this is just an example of, of uh, our product, the Semaphore product uh, and their graph view, right? So you have uh, the different sort of characters here and they are involved in espionage and, and you know, uh, during the Cold War and so on, right? So, so these are the kinds of things where you can say, all right, all the circles are the objects, um, either entities or semantic concepts. And, and then the relationships are, are how they link together. All right, so this talk is really about selecting the right tools and platform for your Gen AI systems. And uh, with that in mind, especially with the RAG architecture, we're gonna talk a little bit about the characteristics that of a RAG architecture that really help your Gen AI systems shine and, and produce good results. So uh, here's some of the characteristics that, that after a lot of trial and error and thought that we've come up with, uh, one is the, the long-term memory system should be a real-time updatable system. It should be able to hold semantically relevant enterprise private data. Its output should be human readable um, and the human readable output should be uh, directly uh, ingestible by the Gen AI systems into its short-term memory. It, the, uh, another thing that's really, really important is that the re what you retrieve should be dependent on your use case um, and it should be dependent on your users. So within a single use case, you should return different things for different people, for example. Uh, it should also adhere to enterprise security standards. Like if uh, only 10% of your user base is allowed to see certain data, well, they should only be able to, the Gen AI that they're interacting with should only be able to see the data that they're allowed to see as well, right? Uh, it should keep track of the governance, the lineage and provenance of where the data is coming from so that explainability and regulatory requirements are easy to meet. And generally speaking, you sh the system should be able to take raw data and create fit for a purpose and fit for use high quality data out of it. Uh, and, and it should not matter where your data lives, the system should be able to pull it and treat it with quality and improve its quality and have it ready for Gen AI systems to use. So now we're gonna just go into each of those bullets that we just talked about and say, all right, why are these things important? And, and what is the business value that you get out of it if you find, if you start implementing these uh, a Gen AI system with these kinds of features? On the private semantic data side, uh, well, if it's private and it's your data, you definitely will get semantic competitive insights. On the semantic side, semantics makes the data operate like an associative memory for Gen AI systems, right? It enables natural language questions. It enables you to find the most relevant data. It works pretty much the way our human memories work. Uh, also, if the data can be updated in real time, then you have a really interesting scenario where you can deprecate the older data because it's stale and not, not, not readily 
relevant to the questions being asked, right? Things like that. Uh, and it definitely solves the data cutoff problem that we've been talking about. Uh, you know, the year and a half lag between what the Gen AI learned and, and its operational uh, version of it. So another thing that we just mentioned was that the Gen AI, that the long-term memory should be Gen AI independent, right? If you think of each of these robots here as being run by a different Gen AI, um, some of these systems will be able to run differently and work better in different cases versus other cases. And so the ability to rapidly switch out your model but keep all of your enterprise private data uh, connected to the new model without having to re-index and re-engineer is a really important aspect of, of a good long-term memory system. Uh, the other thing that you can think about is that the um, you may not just want to switch out models, but you might actually want to use multi -mo multiple models against your data simultaneously, right? And um, that's a really important thing to consider. Um, another thing to note is that the vector database uh, option on the semantics side is tied to a specific version of a Gen AI system which means that it really requires you to re-index and re-generate um, your whole vector database if you decide to switch out your Gen AI model that is generating the vector database for you. Also, as the models get more complex, the vector size get, grows pretty much exponentially. Right, on the human readable side, uh, it's really nice to be able to see what we're feeding the Gen AI system. It's really nice to be able to see what the Gen AI system is producing. So that gives you greater transparency, greater human auditable trails and regulated environments. You can also, in the prompt engineering side of this story, um, say, hey, I'm feeding you this data. Here's the URIs of each of these data sets. Given these URIs, um, if you use any of the data, you have to provide me a reference back as part of the answer so that as a user, I can go back and check the original data very, very rapidly. Not only can you check for the data, but you can also actually check for the graph. So you can provide hot links back to the semantic concepts and have allowed the users to be able to see the semantic concepts that the Gen AI system is using. Another thing you could do is you could use the semantic concepts to say, hey, um, we're going to filter that content and, and check it against the concepts before we send it back to the user, right? So um, these are all different benefits that you get out of a human readable semantic system. Yeah, um, also, um, if you're keeping track of and recording all of the questions and answers or the tasks, um, then uh, you know the good answers that the users find useful and 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 give you a thumbs up for can be used to further train your Gen AI systems. Uh, another way to gain efficiencies is uh, instead of feeding the same question to the, to the Gen AI system over and over again, if you have the audit trail, you can just search for the question and answer in the audit trail and feed that back without ever touching the Gen AI system for the hundredth time for the same answer, right? So that sort of efficiency is, is actually a very good in terms of cost of answering the questions. From a tunable use case dependency perspective, the data that you return back to the Gen AI short-term memory should totally be focused on the use case, but also on the user. And different users um, should get different data fed to their Gen AI system based on who they are um, and based on sort of their level of understanding, right? So in, in sort of the the healthcare case, a consumer is going to refer to heart attacks as heart attacks. A provider is going to refer to them as MI or, my, or myocardial infarction. And the billing folks are really interested in the number 99285 because that's the heart attack ERCPT code, right? Um, so, so when we're searching for the data, the same data could be used, but the relevancy could be tuned to say use a user vocabulary for end users or use a vocabulary for providers or use a vocabulary for billers 
And if you see hits with the biller content, for example, then those should take higher priority in terms of what gets fed into the short-term memory for, of the Gemini system. On the enterprise standard side, right, we've already sort of mentioned it, but if you tie your data to your LDAP systems and your rule-based, uh, query-based um, uh, rules, then, and a user comes in and he has the role for Europe and he's allowed to see GDPR data for people he works with, then that data and only that data becomes available to the Gen AI system as part of the context that you're feeding it. Whereas if, uh, say, a U.S. customer support representative comes in, he would only be able to see data for folks in the U.S., right? So, so the ability to limit what the Gen AI sees based on the user's roles means that the answers that the Gen AI is going to give you are going to be highly coupled to the content that that they're that it's allowed to see and that the user is allowed to see. And then also, um, you want to be able to know where this data is coming from, how has it changed, uh, who has access rights to it, right? Um, all those kinds of things. And, and this is very much needed in a good regulated environment. On the data quality side, uh, if you're, it, it really is garbage in and garbage out. If you're not getting your data in shape and whipping it up and getting it ready, before you feed it to the Gen AI system, the Gen AI system is going to get bad data and give you a bad answer, right? That's just uh, like the foundation of what you need to do in order to get your Gen AI systems to work properly. So uh, getting back, right, uh, we just went through the checklist and we went through why each of these items is really, really important in, in a in the enterprise um, from a selecting the right tool perspective. And uh, um, that's not to say that vector databases are, 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 are not useful. I think vector databases are very useful in non-textual modes of data. But, but I really think that, that the MarkLogic Semaphore semantic data knowledge graph platform gives you really strong business benefits and gets you to better outcomes much faster than you would otherwise be able to get to. This is just a, a quick example of some of the things that, that a knowledge multi-model database can do um, as compared to what a vector database might be able to do. And again, I think both of these systems have their place in your solutioning. Um, it's just you have to understand what you're getting and what you're giving up. All right, a little bit about our, our MarkLogic Semaphore Unified Data Platform. Um, we've been around for years and years um, and have been having multiple versions. Uh, we're already on version 11 of our platform now. Uh, and um, just to give you a quick overview of what it, what is it that this platform does, right? On, on the one hand, we are able to connect to pretty much any kind of data because we can handle structured data, semi-structured data, unstructured data. Um, we're able to connect into the normal enterprise uh, scenarios of uh, uh, orchestration, data orchestration and coordination, microservices, those sorts of things. Um, so it's it's pretty easy to connect our, our, our solutions into your enterprise. Uh, and then MarkLogic acts like that sort of core long-term memory storage and retrieval capability. Um, it's a single enriched source of data. Uh, it, it can look like a graph. Where, when need when you want to query it as a graph, it can look like a document, like a PDF file or a Word document, is a perfectly fine thing to store in MarkLogic or a PowerPoint document for that matter. Um, it can look like uh, rows and columns of a table because that's definitely structured. Structured data is definitely part and parcel of what the enterprise keeps and uses. Uh, it can look like geospatial data. You can do full text search across any of that data, and you can look at it as key value pair data as well um, and do all sorts of uh, normal database-like computations 
on on items that you put into your key value pair uh, uh, indexes. So so that's sort of the bottom aspect. Uh, you know, it's the core sort of base of what you bring. The the semaphore part gives you the upper three things, and really it's about helping you capture and create knowledge graphs, whether it's being done through Gen AI systems or subject matter experts or a combo of both. Um, I'm very much in favor of a combo of both to help you generate your, your knowledge graphs. Uh, once you have those, like we already talked about, it can do classification of content, it can do fact extraction of content. Um, we were just uh, doing a large POC that ran several months uh, with a large pharmaceutical company, and we were able to extract uh, items from very complex oriented tables, not just simple rows and columns, right? Like there were uh, rows and there were header rows and there were like super header rows, right? Things like that, like just diving in and saying, oh, you know, this one piece of information is really important for us to know about. Let's extract that and add that as metadata to the original uh, PDF document that, that we were ingesting. Um, uh, and then, like we've already talked about, for, from a consumption perspective, the, the, the value add that we give you is we give you a Gen AI independent, tunable, relevancy tunable, similarity tunable, clustering tunable system that lets you get the right data to your Gen AI system so it has the context it needs so that it can answer the questions that you're expecting it to answer in a reliable, trustworthy way. Right, and, and uh, Semaphore and MarkLogic are one, uh, a nice large piece of, of progress software. We have a lot of other solutions that work together in this space. Um, and then we have, uh, including full stack observability, application security, uh, and, and so on, right? So uh, how, just like one level deeper into sort of the, you know, how would you use the MarkLogic 7.4 products together to provide this long-term memory for Gen AI systems, right? So, so the first step is to sort of get the data um, uh, and, and put it in a way that you can think about the data in a lot of different model formats. That really makes your data agile, right? You can shape it and reshape it the way you need to. Um, it also adds a very strong layer of security on top of it. Um, you can tie the security directly to your LDAP systems. Uh, then you can also capture the subject matter expertise uh, from, from your um, business experts, uh, store those in a graph. That graph can then be used to uh, tag and fact extract the data. Uh, then when questions come in, um, you can uh, tag and fact extract the question itself or the task itself. Uh, and then when the data is ready to be fed to the Gen AI system, you can further refine that data. For example, in, in, in some PSCs that we've done, we, we were taking full documents and then further filtering it down to sentences only that were relevant to, that were known to be relevant based on the semantic concepts uh, that, that we had captured in our knowledge graphs, right? The results are improved results, increased trustworthiness, uh, better, much better cost savings than, than using a Gen AI system alone. Right, uh, the other really important thing is that um, this unified data platform is deployable and usable today as is, it provides a lot of value even without a Gen AI system. Um, but when you couple it with a Gen AI system, you're really able to improve the trustworthiness of, of the answers and the ta tasks that you give your Gen AI systems to do. Right, um, so again, better accuracy, trustworthiness, cost savings, uh, a very much intuitive way of uh, understanding the prompt and the response for regulatory purposes and uh, also uh, reuse purposes. Um, and this gives you a solid enterprise data architecture. It's not just a one-off data store that we're building specifically for a single AI 
system for a very single custom solution, right? This is totally reusable across all, pretty much all the content in your enterprise. Uh, key takeaways, right? Without good quality, you're gonna get garbage. Hallucinations are a problem, but really it's a lack of context. And if you can provide these systems the right context, they do a much better job. And, and Mark Logic and Semaphore together can give you these guardrails uh, for these Gen AI systems. Uh, it gives you transparent, human-readable answers in, and acts like a long-term memory that, that a human would have access to. On top of that, um, you know, the layers of security that we've put in place, the ability to tie to LDAP and other security protocols is, is all built in. Uh, and we are currently being used across a ton of industries, um, healthcare, life sciences, but also finance, human resources, publishing, manufacturing. Uh, the US government uses us a lot, right? Um, we have a very big presence there as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to our presentation. Jeez, Imran, thank you for that. Uh, you might have noticed that Imran's background has changed. It's the uh, wonders of modern technology. We've got now on the road talking to more people about uh, AI. It's currently at an event. Um, but we've um, already had some questions that have come in. Uh, so we'll get to those in uh, just a second. Uh, but if you could keep those coming in, uh, we'd really love to hear from you. Um, I've got a quick poll here um, that we'd like to, to, to get your um, response back on. Um, and also, um, I'd love to hear, and if you could submit these as um, suggestions as in the questions uh, section of the, 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 the tool, um, I'd love to hear from you about what you want to see from us in the future. Um, I'll give you a quick glimpse of what's coming up. So we've already got another uh, generative AI, this time from um, looking at um, knowledge modeling and um, generative AI from Semaphore. So that's on the 16th of, um, of November. It's on our Bright Talk channel. Um, please go ahead after this and, uh, uh, and subscribe to that one. It should be a good event. Um, but we'd love to hear from you about what you want to hear from us. Do you want us to um, look at uh, generative AI and data bias? Would you like us to look at data security or governance um, with Gen AI? Um, we really use your feedback to um, help us generate these talks um, and we make sure that we, we'll get those in for, for future sessions as we're already planning out um, what we're doing going into to FY24. So yeah, love to hear from you in the chat. Um, but I'll leave that poll up for, for a few more minutes. Um, and Imran, uh, thanks very much uh, for doing this. It's an evolution of a previous talk um, that we've had, and it's um, a topic that's uh, front and center for, for a lot of people. Um, so as I say, we've already got a couple of questions. Um, one very early doors came in, and I think this speaks to a point that I'd like to make, and then I'll, I'll hand it across to you. But um, the question is, we have a very mature organizational taxonomy to help improve search results. Some people say AI will eliminate the need for an organization. Will AI kill? Um, so I'd just like to kind of put the, one of the slides in there and the thing. I think it's really important uh, for, for, for us as an organization, but for, for everybody. What we're talking about here is augmenting the best things you have in your business on your future. You have a depth of knowledge in your business that currently AI can get nowhere. Um, and it's often proprietary as well. Um, and so the AI doesn't even know. Um, will AIs be used to, to help with generating economy, technology, other data, cleansing, and data curation, and hard related work? I'm sure it will in the future. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's really trying to augment that human activity. Currently, we're at the end, maximizing the value of the AI. Um, Imran, uh, What's your thoughts on this? Uh, so, so I have, I have a lot of uh, ways I can answer this question. Um, uh, so there's, there's sort of short term, medium term, and long term. Right, short term, 
Uh, no worries at all. Uh, in fact, your ontology will be very helpful in placing the guardrails around the AI, in extracting relevancy in the, the use case uh, uh, use case specific, uh, um, uh, uh, I guess, relevancy. Yeah, in, in terms of what's important within your you know hundred terabytes of data. These current AI systems, their tokens are limited. Um, like uh, ChatGPT was only three and a half, three thousand words or so. Um, the largest one commercially available right now is uh, Anthropic, Pod.ai. That can handle 150 pages, but 150 pages is not equal to 100 terabytes or, or a petabyte, right? So, yeah. in your organizations, typically you have lots and lots and lots of data. So, finding the right data to give the Gen AI to give it grounding and context in its short term memory and its token space is is extremely important and your ontology will help very much uh um lead that space right the other thing is uh, um in the short to medium term i'm also very much in favor of uh, what i call cyborg systems um uh, which is basically the gen ais and the humans working together to give you the extreme value add that you need for your company the the humans in your company know your company's business better than anything out there, right? Even even because these Gen AI systems currently are trained on public data, right? So so there's that issue. Um, also, even if you decide to train it on your private data, you have this a, a huge security leakage intellectual property concern where you might say, well, I really don't want to give the Gen AI this into its model. In, so that it might be extractable by somebody who doesn't have the rights and privileges to to ask for that data, right? Um, whereas, whereas if you if you use the ontologies and the security and the governance and the lineage to feed just the right data to the to the Gen AI that is tightly tied to the role and the intent of the person, you're going to get really good answers, right? So, so I think in the short to medium term, uh, I would say you're good to go. But what is short to medium term? That's anyone's guess. Um, in the long term, uh, not only do we have an existential threat for ontologies, we have an existential threat for humans that we have to address. And uh, I'm going to leave that uh, unaddressed. You know, for a more ph philosophical topic. Yeah, I yeah. mean, like I said, I'll go back to, to the original thing is, you know, we're augmenting your, your technical expertise, your knowledge um, with, the, with, with the AI. And I think um, that's really key as we don't just talk about gen ai but we talk about smarter content we've talked about smarter information um you know augmenting um knowledge graph information on top of your your data finding those links and relationships is just really important to businesses um in general so um so anyway we'll move on to the next question um and we've got one <clears throat> saying uh, using your examples from the medical domain in the free text fields we observe a wild variety of ways of information uh, is entered across clinics, doctors, receptionists, data clerks within a clinical information system intended to use by all of them. Not much of that is actual natural language. How can you train AI on such data? So I, I've, I would say it is a hard problem. Um, and in, in fact, when we tried to give our, our during sort of our POCs and testing phases with these Gen AI systems, and we tried to give it just a graph and said, okay, here's some reference material. Please answer our question in English. It wanted to spit back code at us. I'm like, no, <laughs> we, we got to be smarter about what we give it, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so so I guess one level of, of uh, training here would be to, to say, um, to use your ontologies and to say, hey, um uh these ontologies are are um are your are your starting point and from these ontologies i want you to generate a set of context in english that says here is the key concept and here is all the synonyms and so now you're using the gen ai to actually create a set of sentences that can, can then be used in the future for the gen ai as reference material right um uh, so, so you can totally, you can totally build out, uh, I guess, reference material in a fashion that is readily consumable by the Gen AI, 
and yet is also in in sort of in real English and human readable. So one, you can check it, and two, um, it won't get confused about whether you're asking for code or whether you're asking for English responses, right? So so that that kind of stuff can can be done to to your to your, to your data to to basically define okay this is the concept here's all the different ways different people can use it in these different contexts like this this user likes to see it this way this user likes to see it this way yeah and that's a perfectly fine thing to sort of document and have the gen ai document in in, in an english paragraph for each yeah. given concept that you're interested in looking at yeah um yeah no um just moving on from that one then um we go i, I love this because i think it summarizes what you've said in 40 minutes into a few sentences, so let's go. So basically, you attach a foundation LLM from a hyperscaler and create a short-term memory based in company data ingested and knowledge graph, and that ingested data stays within the company. I think yeah, you're right, right up until that last little bit. Right, right, right. So, so the the you don't actually have to create the short-term memory. the 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 way the models work is the short-term memory is already there. And whatever you feed into that short-term memory is called prompt engineering. Um, and yes, what you're going to do is you're going to extract uh, your private data, put it into the prompt, give it URIs and say, this is where I got it from, right? So you have lineage and provenance back to your source data sets and you know, exactly where it is in your, your private data when you want to go back and refer to it. Uh, and then you send it to the Gen AI. Now, with certain providers, and most of them have, have kind of acquiesced to this, you can configure those Gen AI systems such that the provider itself agrees not to look at the data you send it. So you have that level of privacy where you can say, hey, um, I'm going to send this data over. I'm going to get an answer back. Uh, Mr. Service Provider, you are not supposed to look at this data. Just like you know, when, when you spin up a virtual machine in AWS Cloud, you expect the AWS Cloud engineers not to look exactly. at yeah. the data on the disk in your virtual machine. right? Yeah. So similar sort of agreements can be put in place to, to Secure. If you again, if you're really worried about security, you can spin up your own uh, private models, and and we have partners that can work in that space too. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, looking at metadata then. So, does generative AI reduce the need to enrich content with metadata? The enrichment process is time-consuming and expensive. It sounds like what you're saying is the enrichment should continue with private data, and then you, you generate to work. Uh, better and then gen AI, gen AI will work better is that correct and i think that that's kind of what you were saying in the piece what what the solution that that imran put together um i think simplifies some of that metadata enrichment and that content mm -hmm. enrichment with that metadata um what, what's your thoughts on that um yeah yes yeah, absolutely uh um, I guess it used to be very difficult to sort and, and a lot of processing and a lot of back and forth that had to happen. Um, uh, Mark Logic is working on a new feature that uh, can essentially do the in place uh, as you're ingesting the data, enrich it and tag it, categorize it as part of the ingestion process. Um, so, so we understand the need for that, and we're we're working squarely to address yeah. that issue. Yeah, but even with uh, with Semaphore right now, that that the, the APIs are set up and, and, and are well understood, and you can do that today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so didn't get the use case dependencies. Should we build or retrieve dozens of ontologies, then map all documents and data sets to ontologies, and then synthesize responses and expect answers to become more relevant with a central, uh, overly complex, I admit, graph? So I don't um, think that's what you were intimating necessarily. No, yeah. So, so, so what I would say is your graphs don't have to be central. Um, they can be very distributed. They can be very use case based. They can very, be very user based. Um, the nice thing uh, that Semaphore allows you to do is have these multiple graphs and sort of combine them together at the at the very last top level use, use user point, right? But each each individual graph could be maintained by a different group, a, a different set of experts. All of that is totally possible to do. So from a governance and management and lineage perspective, uh, if you if you use a tool like Semaphore, you, you'll have a much easier time than one big complex graph. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, have, 
one question that's, uh, from a from a farmer and regulatory point of view: Have you uh, implemented or following ISO or IDMP controlled vocabularies for farmer and regulator? Is that something we've dealt with um, when we're um, dealing with farmer customers? We we have done PSCs with them uh, in in the IDMP space. Um, I am not sure if any of the customers have gone to production with them, but but we we certainly ha uh, know how to do it and have have yeah. done PSCs. Yeah. Um, and then um, kind of a follow up to that almost is how do you approach data governance and strategy to go to data management, securing, um, e.g. like reusing or repurposing of data components. So within within that. Can you rephrase the question? I think they're talking about how would you um, uh, impose data governance um, oh, sure. uh, levers on the on the data to ensure yeah. that certain users or certain uh, roles can only have access to a certain level of data um, or access to change data that type of thing. To totally. Um, so so, Mark Logic tends to store things in in a treat like format, whether it's XML or JSON, which means you can have your data in one section, but you can also have a whole bunch of metadata in another section. And the metadata can be extremely specific to your company. And so the ability to say, hey, this metadata is going to control security, or this metadata is going to control lineage, or this meta is going to control use rights yes. of this data, right? So the, the ability to have that tied in directly with your data is basically like putting a QR code on top of uh, an asset, right? Yeah. Um, and that QR code has all of the metadata about that asset, but the asset itself is usable in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think um, I think that we're coming up to nearly the top of the hour. I think we've we've got to the end of some really good questions there. Um, we'd love your feedback. There's a feedback after this um, from from Bright Talk where we can see the feedback uh, comments. So again, put your feedback in for what you'd like to see in the future. What you'd like to hear from Imran or others. Um, please do sign up for that event on the 16th of um, November from uh, our team over at Semaphore. Um, and they'll take the uh, knowledge graph and knowledge modeling uh, from a semaphore point of view. And I think it'll speak to some of those questions that we had around um, around that as well. So um, so I think that should be really valuable. We've got uh, an ebook coming up on this topic that'll go into, into what Imran's discussed today. Um, and we're also looking at um, uh, we're looking at uh, other content that uh, that's more technical in nature, how-to guides, things like that, um, so that you can start playing around with this uh, with your own implementations of Mark Logic and Semaphore. Um, one last question, just because we've got three minutes: um, Which vector DB native to Mark Logic support? I think that is: Do we support vector databases natively? I think that's the question. Uh, right. Uh, so, so the answer is is not right now. Um, yeah. We we have been uh, testing um, different kinds of vector databases. Yeah. Uh, uh, but but the what I would like to say is that that at least for textual and semantic data, the the benefits you get with for for not using a vector database are, are extremely large. Yeah. And and and. And for texture and semantic data, I would definitely focus on the capabilities that MarkLogic and Semaphore provide out of the box. Uh, and then, and then we are looking actively at yeah. which vector database type technology to include in the future. Yeah, I, I've only I've only put that question in because I was speaking to the guy that was testing it, so that would give him more interest yeah. <laughs> to, to get it get it sorted. Um, but no, thank you again, Imran, for for taking the time to to walk us through these. Um, the, it's really interesting area of development both internally for us at Mark logic and for, for for our customers and our partners if you've got anything that you'd like to follow up up uh, with us um, please reach out um, to uh, csm mark logic at progress.com um, or uh, alternatively you can find myself and imran on uh, on linkedin on twitter um, and uh, it's first dot last name uh, at progress.com if you would like to email us Thanks again for all of your questions, um, and we look forward to, to speaking with you again in the near future. Cheers yes, thank you for joining. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.